history, then it becomes philosophy. This in part corresponds to Hegel, of course. But however, it clearly maps very closely onto Gentile's absolute forms of the spirit. The triad I've mentioned already of art, religion and knowledge, except that Collingwood retains art and religion and divides knowledge into three moments. And that's what gives you the five-part series. So knowledge has the subjective or questioning moment of science, the objective or answering moment of history, and the absolute synthesis of philosophy. And the emphasis here is on the unity of the spirit or experience in all its appearances. Michael Oakeshott, who's less well known in many places than the others, is interesting. He talks about the modes of experience. He has history, science, practice, and later on he added art to this. But his, he, re, he regards them as essentially entirely separate. There's no dialectical relationship between them. You're either in one or you're in another or you're in another. But there's no dialectical relationship, overlap, or development. In this sense, he's much more like Croce than he is like Gentile or Hegel or Collingwood. Okay, that's background. Anyone following Collingwood's career in the 1920s would have seen that he was an advocate for the philosophy of Croce, De Ruggiero and Gentile. But he was also engaged in developing his own philosophy, along lines that they suggested, but they didn't determine. Now, one of his key works is the Essay on Philosophical Method, which came out in 1933. In this, he developed the idea of a scale of forms. Now, there are... If anyone wants to ask me a question about this, I will answer this at length, so I'll say this very quickly. He wanted to do justice to the philosophical work of his forebears. He'd been engaging with Hegel, Plato, Bradley, Croce and Gentile on the nature of a dialectical scale, on the nature of the philosophical concept. In the book, Collingwood doesn't mention Croce, but um, his presence can be felt because one of his concerns was to take account of Croce's criticism of Hegel's notion of dialectic. For Croce, philosophical concepts which are related by opposition exhibit dialectical relations. Philosophical concepts related only by distinction, however, cannot enter into dialectical relations. Collingwood's view is that this distinction, by which Croce gets rid of much of Hegel's dialectic, ends up by throwing away the possibility of philosophy itself. In Collingwood's view, because philosophical concepts are related by both opposition and distinction, and because they're both universal and categorical, they're re related dialectically and arrange themselves as a scale of forms. So this is a modification of, Croce's and, of both Croce's and Hegel's dialectic. And what it does for Collingwood is enable him to reappraise the work of philosophers who he esteems highly, like Plato, Aristotle, Leibniz, Locke, Kant and Hegel, and he says they follow this method, but he interprets, reinterprets the method and then projects that back onto them. And in particular, he does this with Bradley's philosophy because he then is able to admit what earlier in his career he denied, which is the doctrine of degrees of truth and reality. Once he'd understood them as constituting a scale of forms, he was able to say, yes, I can go with this idea. But before that, he wasn't. So, Collingwood was an active, possibly the leading disseminator and expositor of Gentile's and Croce's philosophy. He was also a creative thinker in his own right. And as I said before, he wanted to be taken seriously, and he couldn't get taken seriously if he was seen only as a follower of the Italian neo-idealists. And of course, increasingly, from uh, the late 1920s onwards, the issue arose of the political allegiances of Croce and Gentile. And Collingwood became increasingly vehement as an anti-fascist, so he became increasingly wary of Gentile. Didn't mean that he let him go, by the way. Because Gentile had a positive influence on Collingwood. For Collingwood, Croce denied the unity of the spirit because he rigidly separated the forms. So he owed a lot to Croce, especially in relation to the internal, internal analysis of each form of the spirit. If you look at Collingwood on history or Collingwood on art, you can see there's a lot of Croce in there. 
But if you talk about the relationship between art and history, then you find that he doesn't follow Croce, at least not in the same way. What Collingwood found in Gentile was an insistence on the unity of the spirit. And this is what Collingwood set himself the task of doing, to put forward a view in which distinctions were retained, but within an overall unity. And that's what we see in Spectral and Mentis. And we see the methodological justification of this in his essay on philosophical method. And again, Collingwood insisted always that we should think in philosophy of our object as activity, not as substance. And that's a Gentilian way of conceiving of these things. And that's what Collingwood does in earlier papers, such as political action and economics as a philosophical science. Now, both Croce and De Ruggiero noticed Collingwood's approach and criticised or approved of it accordingly. Collingwood, through his translations, introduced De Ruggiero to an Italian, to an English audience. But De Ruggiero introduced Collingwood to an Italian audience in his uh, Philosophie del Novecento. This was published too early to include reference to Collingwood's later work, but it is an interesting summary account of Collingwood's earlier work. De Ruggiero remarked that, although Collingwood's approach might seem familiar to Italian readers, nonetheless the reader has to pay attention both to his style of thought and its content based on spiritual experiences which are new and irreducible to their Italian origin. He discusses Speculum Mentis, refers to Croce's criticism of it, and comments that, in divergence from Croce, he thinks that the main nexus of spiritual activities results from a dialectic of, opposi of opposites and not distincts. On this point, is he in agreement with Gentile's view? But I should say, of course, this was modified later. He then adds in a critical reference to Gentile, which mirrors Collingwood's own, that in the book we never come across the mere formalism in which the Italian idealistic school going by the name of actual idealism has ended and rests content. So you can see that he's referring to contemporary developments in the school of Gentile and Croce there. And Croce quite liked Collingwood's work, but he took issue with the influence of Gentile. He thought Gentile was a malign influence. So in 1921, Collingwood had concluded his paper on Croce's philosophy of history with the hope that Croce's philosophy could now reach the point of absolute idealism to which his successors Gentile and De Ruggiero have already carried his thought. Croce bridled at this. For him, his thought was already where it ought to be. And he said of Collingwood's criticism that it was identical to that which had been ringing in my ears and coming before my eyes for 10 years or more in Italy. These advocates of actual idealism, a sublime yet empty philosophy, had accused me of not having raised myself to that sublimity, sublimity, yes, <laughs> of not having dissolved all distinctions in the act and thereby of being both a realist and an idealist, one in contradiction of the other. Croce then demonstrated both an exalted view of his own status and that he saw De Ruggiero as a conduit of malign philosophical influence. Croce sounds very weary at this point. Having patiently explained why I could not accept this new revelation, I expected it to fade away and to fall into oblivion, as was its very nature, and as in fact eventually happened. At that time, the extreme and very radical theorist of actual idealism was De Ruggiero, who, having gone to England, informed Collingwood of his opinion and put him on guard against my philosophizing, which was old-fashioned, naturalistic, empiricist, and so on. Thus Collingwood ended his work with a salute to my two successors, that is, De Ruggiero and his master and colleague, i.e. Gentile. Now, we've given evidence of Collingwood's philosophical adherence to Gentile. Further examples are easy to find. Uh, I won't quote these passages now, but I'll just you can read them yourself. But Collingwood in his lectures on ethics, you find a lot of uh, passages there, especially early on, where clearly he's writing in the manner of Gentile. But I won't quote, I'll move down the page a little bit. Now, as already suggested, Collingwood, especially in his later writings, assimilated the thought of Collingwood to his own, rather than expressly said that he was being influenced by him. And he did this in a dual sense. Sometimes using Gentile's thought as a sounding board, 
and thus finding his own thought in it, sometimes expressing himself in Gentilian shorthand in his own notes, and later translating the result into English philosophical approach. So, as I near the end, I will give an example of each. So, the first example. The published version of Collingwood's 1936 British Academy lecture on human nature and human history, which is central to the idea of history, reveals the influence of Gentile, but doesn't mention it. So Collingwood casually com comments that mind is what it does, you know, with a Gentilean formula. He attributes the idea to Hume, who was right, he says, to maintain that there's no such thing as spiritual substance, nothing that a mind is distinct from and underlying what he does. So it was clear that he didn't want to publicly identify himself with Gentile. He wanted his audience to listen. And in the year of the publication of A.J. Ayer's Language, Truth and Logic, the best way to ensure that it listened was to invoke the name of Hume rather than Gentile, at least in Oxford. That he had Gentile in mind, however, is made strikingly clear in the preparatory notes for the lecture. So in a summary statement, he says, what is falsely called human history, human nature is really human history. The fundamental theses of such a view would be these. One, human nature is mind. We are not talking about bodily nature, only of mental, with the proviso that mind always means embodied mind. Two, mind is pure act. Mind is not anything apart from what it does. The so-called powers or faculties of mind are really activities. Activity does not A, exhibit or reveal the nature of mind, or B, develop or explicate its unrealized potential, potentialities. It is mind. Third, the pure act posits itself in its own presuppositions at once. The past belongs to the present, not the present to the past. Whereas in nature, the present is the cause effect of the past, in mind the past is the analysed content of the present. Thus what the mind is and what it does are its past and present respectively. Fourth, past time is therefore as a schema of mind self-knowledge. It can know itself only sub specie praeteritorum. To know oneself is simply to know one's past and vice versa. The philosophy or science of the human mind thus equals history. But if you look at the, the lecture as it was delivered, the final version, all of that talk, any of that reference, was replaced, and the points amplified into plain English narrative for a plain English audience. So the substance is attained, but the language discarded. So, to draw to a conclusion, final point, I mean, I've written about this elsewhere, it's an interesting thing, Collingwood didn't like Gentile's fascism. He wanted to dissociate himself from that, but he still liked Gentile's philosophy. That led to Collingwood being in a bit of a dilemma, because if the philosophy is what led Gentile to fascism, what was Collingwood to do? Now, I'm not going to talk more about that at the moment, but it is interesting that in 1937 he comes back to Gentile and speaks highly of Gentile. Collingwood helped steer the volume of essays, which was edited by Klebanski and Payton, on philosophy of history through the, Cl through the Clarendon Press. He did a lot of work for them. On its publication he wrote a lengthy review and singled out Gentile's paper, The Transcending of Time in History, for attention. And he says, one implication of the truth, that what the historian seeks to do is to discover the thought of historical agents, is worked out by Signor Gentile. He holds that all reality is historical. What is indubitably historical is the life of the human mind. For Gentile, mind is the only reality. Time is transcended in history because the historian, in discovering the thoughts of a past agent, rethinks that thought for himself. It is known, therefore, not as a past thought, contemplated, as it were, from a distance through the historian's time telescope, but as a present thought living now in the historian's mind. Thus, by being historically known, it undergoes a resurrection out of the limbo of the dead past, triumphs over time, and survives in the present. This is an important idea, and I believe a true one. Of course, what Collingwood is doing here, he's praising Gentile, he's giving an account of Gentile, but he's also reading his own theory of historical reenactment into Gentile. 
So in saying that this view is important and true, he was in effect recommending his own position at the same time, because our whole doctrine of reenactment is central to Collingwood's later philosophy of history. So you can see that he never quite let Gentile go. Even during the New Leviathan, which he wrote just before he died, in 1942, he was still talking in Gentilean language at various points, but again, without mentioning his name. I'm going to draw to a close, so you might ask what my conclusion is. Well, there is no conclusion. Philosophy is an eternal dialectic, but temporality dictates that I have to stop somewhere, and that's going to be now. So thank you for listening. Grazie al professor Connelly per l'eccellente relazione estremamente informata che ci ha offerto un panorama molto preciso dei rapporti tra eh, il neoidealismo britannico e l'idealismo italiano, specialmente eh, eh, rappresentato da tre eh, figure importanti come Croce Gentile e anche Guido De Ruggero. Ecco, io, la relazione è stata corposa, interessante, il tempo che abbiamo speso per essere è stato molto ben speso e qui però non ci rimane moltissimo tempo per la discussione. In ogni caso eh, qualche domanda qualche potrà essere posta, qualche problema sollevato e quindi eh, se c'è qualcuno che vuole intervenire la parola ecco gli offerte ecco, alzi qui alzi bene la voce così la sentiamo tutti può parlare in inglese se si preferisce sì. anche al microfono ok è possibile dove from Hegel's paragraph 343, if I'm correct, of the philosophy of right. Uh, der Geist ist was er tut. Um, de, nein, der Geist ist seine Tat. Und er ist nur was er tut. Der Mensch ist nichts anderes als die Waage seiner Tat. That too, yes. So I, I just wonder why i mean, you may have said something similar, of course, but being that these were mm. sort of Hegelians, I was wondering. <laughs> well, I think the, first of all, yes, Colin was aware of that, and oh, Colin yeah. wrote quite a sense of, he, he's unpublished in this text. Yeah. He wrote on Hegel's logic, for example, and it was Collingwood who um, encouraged Knox to publish the philosophy of right in English in 1942 and saw that through the press. So, yes, he was aware of that and does quote it. And, but what he tends to do is to give Hegel very often a Gentilian or a neo-Italian idealistic interpretation, I think. And that's why the phrase looms so large. So although it appears in Hegel, it's, you know, it's fundamental to Gentile and so on. And the way that Collingwood uses it, I think, comes approximately from from Gentile. The other point is that for the audience in Oxford in 1936, now even though I think Theodore Adorno was probably in the audience at that time, well he was in Oxford the night before, I know that much. So I think he was probably there because he listened to T.M. Knox the night before. And so I think, you know, and T.M. Knox was there, and you know, these were Hegelians, but Collingwood I think was deliberately seeking out a different audience. And that's why he talks about Hume, because Hume denies spiritual substance. Because he wants to say, I don't have to stick with Hegel or these other people, because in 1936, 
even though he was supporting um, M.B. Foster's work on Hegel, which came out in 1935, he supported Muir's books on Hegel. He read them to the press. He supported Knox's translation of Lofty Right. He did all of that work, but in public, he often just talks about the British philosophers. And in part, this might be, I mean, when he was discussing with Gilbert Ryle in 1935 uh, about the ontological argument, they had a lengthy correspondence. Yeah, well, there's a lengthy correspondence which I published as part of the new edition of an essay on philosophical method. And Collingwood really takes pains to you know, say, look, I know my Hume as well as you know your Hume. <laughs> so don't talk to me about Hume. So I think, I think it's what language is going to gain the attention of the philosophical audience of the time. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank <laughs> you. Ci sono altre domande? Most famous work of Gentile was La, Re La Riforma della Dialettica Hegeliana. By whom was this work influenced? Yes, the yes, work of Gentile. By whom was it influenced? I don't know. I don't know what answer No. By nothing. By no nobody. Mm -hmm. And what was uh, the influence of his work uh, uh, to the uh, neo-idealistic thinkers? I mean, it's curious that that particular piece, I'm not seeing... Sorry, yeah. The, um, the question is about Gentile's um, reform of the Hegelian dialectic. I've not seen anywhere Colin would refer to that piece, oddly enough, although he must have known of it because he did, um, first of all, he read Italian, and he had copies of the works of all of the Italians. Um, some of those copies are still in his library. His copies of Croce, annotated, are still in his library, and I've looked at the annotations. There's very little of Gentile there, so I've not seen his copy of that. Uh, and it might be that you know, he kept the Croce, I and mean, he had the Croce especially bound up, they're very nicely bound, um, but I don't know what happened to the Gentile books in his library. So I don't know how far Collingwood himself read or was influenced by that particular work. Now, I know that Collingwood thought highly of the pedagogia, he, and he thought less well of, of Gentile's logic. He thought quite well, I think, of the theory of mind as pure act, but I really don't know about his view about the reform of the Hegelian dialectic, because I've not seen a direct reference in all of Collingwood's writings to it. So I'm at a loss to answer your question, I'm afraid. Thank you. My apologies. Altre domande? Ecco, stiamo esaurendo il tempo, l'ora a disposizione per la relazione. Allora a disposizione per la relazione del professor Connelly. E, ecco, se non ci sono altri che desiderano intervenire, ecco, io avrei qualche commento molto breve da fare nel tempo rimasto. Dico eh, molto breve perché buona parte delle tematiche eh, accennate, delineate dal professor Connelly nella sua relazione, nella sua interpretazione del pensiero di Collingwood, si riproporranno nella mia stessa relazione, anche se non di riferite a degli autori in particolare, ma considerate piuttosto nei loro fondamenti teoretici. Comunque il problema mi sembra chiaro, è quello stesso che io adesso cercherò di affrontare e auspicabilmente risolvere. 
è il problema di, della relazione tra una concezione speculativa della filosofia che Collingwood leggeva giustamente in Gentil ma che dichiara ascendenza hegeliana da un lato e delle concezioni antimetafisiche che e rifiutano completamente il punto di vista della filosofia speculativa o perlomeno lo riducono, come il caso di Croce, a una cosiddetta dialettica degli opposti che però diviene molto parziale e viene sussunta nell'ambito di una concezione dello spirito che ormai non è più né idealistica né speculativa ma chiaramente storicistica. Ecco, il vero problema mi sembra alla radice del contrasto da Croce Gentile che riflette un ben più ampio contrasto tra le tendenze speculative della filosofia contemporanea, di chiara ascendenza hegeliana, e lo storicismo contemporaneo, che è qualcosa di completamente diverso. Ecco, questo eh, conf conflitto chiaramente eh, si eh, ripresenta nell'interpretazione di Collingwood e mi sembra che Collingwood abbia visto molto bene, mettendo in luce come la posizione gentiliana, ecco, sia teoreticamente superiore a quella crociana, almeno da questo punto di vista, lasciando stare le implicazioni politiche. Ecco, quello che mi sembra, e, mi sembra, e questo, questa osservazione corrisponde un po' a quanto ha messo in, è venuto in luce dall'intervento del professor Schneider, è che, mi sembra almeno, io di Collingwood ho letto quella che lui stesso giudicava la sua opera più importante, cioè l'essere in un philosophical method. E qui il riferimento a Platone e a Hegel soprattutto è estremamente generico e quindi io ritengo eh, appunto legittimo considerare l'appropriazione e lo sviluppo colliguodiano della filosofia ecco, speculativa come mediato quasi interamente da Gentile. Il, non c'è un riferimento, un confronto diretto, analitico con la complessità del pensiero hegeliano e tantomeno con la scienza della logica, con la fenomenologia dello spirito o col sistema. Si rimane ecco, sempre ad un'appropriazione mediata da altri e qui mi sembra appunto che sia il caso appunto, di fare riferimento gentile. Questo mi sembra che sia emerso molto bene nella relazione di eh, professor Connelly. E a me non mi sorprende che i pensatori che c'è un pochino co 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 indotti a conoscerci, cioè Errol Harris, invece rappresenti quella tendenza dell'egalismo e de, dell'idealismo britannico che più direttamente vuole richiamarsi alla lezione hegeliana, cioè senza eh, isolare qualche tema, la dialettica o la teoria delle forme dello spirito, ma cercando di confrontarsi con l'intero sistema. E l'indizio più chiaro di questo diverso atteggiamento è il fatto che tutte le tendenze del neoidealismo neo contemporaneo, sia britannico, con l'eccezione di Errol Harris, che italiano hanno considerato in maniera estremamente negativa, a volte addirittura sprezzante, la naturfilosofia hegeliana, ritenendola o una scienza filosofica fallita o addirittura il tentativo illegittimo di trascendere la pura immanenza del pensiero speculativo e di cadere così in uno di quei, come Gentile diceva, residui di realismo e trascendenza che il vero idealismo dovrebbe espungere completamente. Quindi un atteggiamento chiaramente polemico, critico, negativo contro l'intera costruzione della filosofia della natura di Hegel e con conseguenza che è chiara, cioè il rifiuto della, del valore teoretico del sistema hegeliano. E invece Errol Harris, e questo il professor Connelly ce lo potrà spiegare ulteriormente, magari nel successivo dibattito, ha messo bene in luce come negli anni della sua formazione all'Università di Oxford Errol Harris studiò per conto suo quasi la filosofia della natura di Hegel e fu così affascinato da questa parte del sistema hegeliano da entrare in conflitto, in un certo senso, con i suoi maestri e a riproporre quindi l'importanza di una appropriazione più completa, più in-depth e meno schematica, meno formalistica del pensiero di Hegel. E questa mi sembra che sia la una delle tendenze più significative dello sviluppo del neoidealismo britannico fino ai giorni nostri ecco, e credo anche che la forza della tradizione iumiana empiristica nella filosofia eh, britannica anglosassone in generale che è notevole non sia a tutt'oggi ancora in grado di aver estinto la voce di questo neoidealismo per me ecco ho detto quello che credevo di poter dire e adesso ci prendiamo un quarto d'ora, uno dieci minuti di riposo, se non avete altre domande, se volete discutere voi, e poi appunto 
che sarà la mia relazione storicismo e metafisica e la filosofia contemporanea in cui non sarete sorpresi che dopo quello che ho detto di vedere tanti temi enunciati, annunciati dal professor Connery ripresi in altra prospettiva, in altro linguaggio forse da chi vi parla. Bene.